bias has to do with bad decisions about people. So bad decisions about people. And what you want to do is avoid these bad decisions. But we tend to make these bad decisions all the time just because of how our brains are wired, how we think, how we feel. And that's something we need to address. We need to understand where that comes from and how we can make better decisions that prevent these unconscious biases and address these unconscious biases. Again, the first part of the presentation will be on what they are specifically, where they come from. So understanding them a little bit more, a little better. The second part of the presentation will focus more on gaining awareness of them on steps to solve them, which involve gaining awareness of them and then specific techniques to address them. So that's the shape of the presentation so that you know where we're headed, the roadway of the future. All right, let's kick off the presentation itself. And first I want to talk about confidence. Confidence as a factor in our evaluations of others and our decision-making about others. We're told to be confident. Being confident is an important quality, important quality when you make decisions as a project manager, important quality when you evaluate people, important quality as you lead your work activities. And confidence is indeed important as part of making decisions. And so it's important not only in just making decisions around your work, but in other life areas as well. So I want to talk a little bit about another life area before we get to confidence, before we talk about your work. And that's something about, that's about driving. And so I want to ask you, do you consider yourself an above average driver or below average driver? An above average driver or a below average driver? Now, you'll be able to see right now a poll in the Zoom meeting where you can answer that question. When evaluating your own driving skills, would you say you're in the top half or in the bottom half of all drivers? Are you in the top half or the bottom half of all drivers? Please go ahead and vote. Top half or bottom half? See about 82% of the people voted. Let's give the rest a little bit more time. I'll give you five more seconds for those who haven't voted yet. Five more seconds to make your voice heard. All right, thank you. Let's see what the votes are. Okay, interestingly enough, we see that the 93% of you are in the top half of all drivers. So 93% of you are in the top half of all drivers and 7% you know, of you are in the bottom. Now that's probably a little bit unrealistic, isn't it? <laughs> that everyone here would just be by magic in the top half of all drivers. By definition, you know, half the people are in the top half, half the people are in the bottom half. That's what top half and bottom half means. But the people on this call answer that they're in the overwhelmingly in the top half. And that's indeed what studies tend to show, that people tend to be greatly overconfident about their decisions in all life areas. So it's not simply their decisions in how to drive. You know, this was asked, uh, there was a similar survey asked of college students and college students who have much, much less experience than you. They were asked, you know, would you consider yourself above average driver, below average driver? And 94% of them consider themselves an above average drivers, even though they had much less experience than many of you have driving. So that's an example of overconfidence in action. And the overconfidence is that makes us have bad decision-making around other people when we're evaluating them or about our driving or about task management, project management. How many people do you see being overconfident about their plans for a project? It's called the overconfidence bias. So that's something you really want to be aware of and address in your decision-making, the overconfidence bias. We tend to be greatly overconfident in all of our decisions, including about people, where a lot of unconscious bias comes from, where we make certain assumptions and certain evaluations of people, and we feel confident that they're correct, and then we don't change them based on new evidence. That's a big problem, and that happens very often. So overconfidence bias describes our tendency to be way too confident. You need to be aware of this bias within you and address it effectively. Now, studies show that when people say they're 100% confident, you know, they'll bet the farm, they'll bet their career, 
they are actually right 80% of the time, only 80% of the time, you know, no wonder Las Vegas makes so much money or used to make so much money before the pandemic, right? This is a huge problem, and not only in gambling, but in all sorts of professional decision-making, again, around people or others, way to be too confident, especially dangerous for those with more expertise and authority. You might be surprised by that, but when you have more expertise and authority research so shows, we tend to be more confident, but not necessarily more right. For example, there was a study done of doctors comparing senior doctors, well-experienced ones, you know, many decades in the field and ones just out of medical school. So comparing those, they were given the same case to evaluate. And they were right in evaluating the case, what was the condition, prescribing the medications, whether to address it, prescribing the course, treat, course of free treat, treatment. They were right at the same rate. These senior doctors, very experienced ones with a lot of know-how and those just out of med school. But the senior experienced ones were way more confident about their evaluation, way more confident. Now, why were they right at about the same rate? Well, because senior doctors, of course, have more experience, but these junior doctors just out of med school have fresher knowledge and information. So that is why they're right at about the same rate, but way too much confidence by senior doctors. So that's something to watch out for from the perspective of those of you who are in more senior positions, more senior leadership roles, or have spent a lot of time in the project management field and feel you know everything, much of what there is to know about it. Why do we make such bad decisions? Well, we're told that we should go with our gut. We should follow our intuition. We should trust our hearts and all of that. Gurus like Tony Robbins tell us these things. Tony Robbins, who tells us to be primal, be savage. And Malcolm Gladwell, who tells us to make our decision in the blink of an eye in his book, Blink. It feels very comfortable to get such advice, which is why they make so much money. They tell people what feels comfortable and people like hearing that and they pay for that, right? Tony Robbins and Malcolm Gladwell get the big bucks. They get the big bucks because they tell people what people want to hear. But trusting your gut, following your intuition, going with your heart, it often leads to disastrous decisions around people and projects, unfortunately. Because our gut, you know, Unfortunately, regardless of what Tony Robbins tells us to be primal, be savage, our gut is actually not evolved for the modern world. You should not be primal, you should not be savage. It's evolved for the ancient savanna, not our current complex multicultural global reality. For example, around people, one of the most fundamental things of that ancient savanna is that we lived in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people when we were hunters, gatherers, and foragers. And so we are wired to be tribal. Our intuition, our emotions, our heart, all of those are wired to be tribal. And they push, we are constantly pushed by our emotions, our feelings to be tribal. That's what's comfortable for us, being tribal, looking for people like us, people who share our values, who share our predispositions, who share our preferences, and not really being in favor of people who don't who don't share our values, our appearances, our predispositions, our preferences, our cultural background, all of that comes from the problems of tribalism. And of course, in the Savannah environment, it was very important to be tribal. If you weren't sufficiently tribal, you'd be kicked out of your tribe and you died. And if you weren't sufficiently hostile to other tribes, they take over your tribe's territory and you die as well. Neither of those is a great situation. We don't want that to happen. So our ancestors had this wiring and built in them. And we are the descendants of those ancestors who were the most tribal, who were the most effective because they survived and reproduced. And so we're their descendants. We have to understand that this happens. And this tribalism is a root cause of unconscious bias. There are other causes, but the specific ways that our brain goes wrong the specific dangerous judgment errors we make around other people and projects and all sorts of activities are called cognitive biases. So cognitive biases, there are over a hundred of them in uh, the scholarship on cognitive biases, over a hundred cognitive biases, you know, big problem. And you can go on Wikipedia, look them up, list of cognitive biases, they'll tell you about them. These are dangerous judgment errors that cause us to deviate away from making the best decisions around people, around projects, around activities. 
it comes from a combination of our evolutionary background and the way our brains are wired. So just the structure of our brains, you might've heard about the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, all of these sorts of things. I'll be happy to talk about it later in the Q&A for those people who are interested in these topics, but I'm not going to go into much depth about them now. All right, so let's take a look at another poll. Did the following ever happen to you? You made a bad decision, but looking back, you realized you had the information you needed to make a better decision, whether it's about a person or about other things. So please go ahead and vote. You made a bad decision, but you realized later you really had the information to make a better decision. I mean, it certainly happened to me. I hired, uh, I promoted actually from the ranks, someone who was in, who be, to become the assistant manager of the company I run, disaster avoidance experts, training, consulting, and coaching company. And this person, I thought that she'd work out well, but she did not work out very well. She couldn't let go of her previous position. She turned out to be very much of a micromanager. It wasn't a great experience. So that's a problem. That's something you don't want to see happen. Okay, I see two thirds of you voted. So let's get a couple more people voting. And make your voice heard. I'll give you five more seconds. Five more seconds. Thank you. Okay. So we see interestingly the same breakdown that we saw before. 93% of you say that the follow that it did happen to you, that you really had the information that you needed to make a better decision. And for the 7% of you that didn't, I'm glad to hear that's not experience that happened to you, but the vast majority of you, that happened to you. And that's really an experience of a cognitive bias where you have the information that you need in a you know, if you were perfectly rational and use the information effectively, you would be able to make the better decision. But we are not perfectly rational. And that's okay. It's just who we are as human beings. We have to realize that unconscious bias comes from us not being perfectly rational about other people. Cognitive biases are the specific ways that our brain goes wrong. The specific ways our brain is miswired. And overconfidence bias is one of these ways. So that's one out of over a hundred cognitive biases that you really need to learn about and be aware of within yourself in order to avoid these bad decisions. Now let's talk about something that probably a number of you have been wondering as I've been speaking. Probably not when you initially saw me, you know, I look like a white mainstream American male, but once you heard me speaking, you probably realized hey, this guy has an accent, where's he from? <laughs> I get that question very often, where are you from? I'll be happy to tell you. I'm from a small country called Moldova. It's in Eastern Europe and it's so small that it's a less small landlocked country. It's so small that you need an arrow pointing out where it is. You can't actually write it on the country itself. Tiny country. My parents, I was born in 1991. My parents came to the United States when I was 10, so 1991. And I was very glad that they came to this country, especially in 1996, when there was a world value survey, which showed that out of all countries in the world, Moldova is the, the, they surveyed is the least happy country in the world, the least happy country in the world. I have no idea why I left when I was 10, but that is certainly something that made me especially glad that my parents came to the United States. Now we settled in New York City, which really is a cultural melting pot, very diverse metropolis, and I heard so many different accents around me, so many different accents. You know, a number of immigrants, you probably know when they came as kids, like I did, they chose to drop their accent. They trained themselves to speak you know, high quality mainstream American English. Now, my parents taught me to be proud of my cultural heritage and living in the melting pot of New York City, I decided that, hey, I'll keep my accent. I won't try to eliminate it. Well, unfortunately, what I found out later as I was working on my PhD in the history of behavioral science and looking at these questions, cognitive biases, I learned that was kind of a dumb decision on my part because of a phenomenon called accent discrimination. Accent discrimination, what's that about? Well, according to extensive research, Americans have a tendency to discriminate against those with foreign accents. That's one out of many forms of unconscious bias, of unconscious discrimination that folks have. They perceive those with foreign accents as being less trustworthy. 
So when you compare those with a mainstream American accent over those with not, those with who don't, who have a foreign accent are perceived as less trustworthy, unfortunately. There's only one foreign accent to which this really doesn't apply, and that's the British accent. They still have that cultural imperialism going for them. So if you can do a British accent, kudos for you. You'll probably even get perceived as more trustworthy <laughs> than the average American. So that's accent discrimination. And that's not a cognitive bias by itself, but it's an expression of that uh, unconscious bias around other people. But the specific cognitive bias, the broader cognitive bias that's going on here is the horns effect. And there are two cognitive biases that are related to each other, the horns effect and the halo effect. The horns effect refers to somebody having little horns, somebody having little horns. If you dislike one characteristic of someone, like their accent, you'll tend to have two negative view of the other characteristics. Why is that? Well, their accent tells you that they're not from around here. They're not part of your tribe. The same thing for their politics. You know, if you don't like their politics or if something about their religion strikes you as something that's opposed to your values perspectives, anything about their cultural background, their appearance, all of these sorts of things, all of these sort of discrimination, you know, isms that we hear about that are legally protected, but also things that aren't legally protected like accents. All of those sorts of things come from tribalism where we perceive somebody who doesn't share what we have, these tribal things that we perceive as part of our tribe. And we tend to have a discomfort and dislike toward these people. The halo effect is the opposite problem. If we like one characteristic, we tend to have too positive view of the other person's other characteristics. It's like you put a little halo on somebody's head. So you have, you know, if you like their politics, their values, their religion, their skin color, their ethnicity, their all of these sorts of things, the legally protected stuff and the not legally protected stuff. You like their cultural background and so on, you know, which college you went to. You will tend to have too positive view of their other characteristics. This is a, of course a big problem and it's especially dangerous for business relationships. It happens within companies. So I've seen a lot of companies where there are serious tensions between different departments. For example, sales versus operations is a big area of tensions I've seen where people in sales and marketing over promise because they want to make the sale and the operations you know, gets really upset with uh, the production, gets really upset with what they promised. And then they have a form a dislike of each other. Instead of collaborating together effectively, there's kind of conflicts between departments. That, that's one example out of many, many examples. I see conflicts between accounting and production because you know accounting wants to save money, production wants to spend money, and sales, of course, and accounting between legal and pretty much everyone else. So these are the kinds of tensions that are unnecessary within companies, but they happen all the time because of the horns effect. And the halo effect where people within the sales feel good about each other, the halo effect were part of the team, but opposed to that team and the operations. It's a big problem. It's also a problem externally, of course, for hiring promotion internally, but hiring as well. So I'll give you an example, an interesting episode where I was giving a presentation to, uh, as a closing keynote to an audience of professionals in DEI professionals, HR professionals who were interested in diversity and inclusion, experts in diversity and inclusion in Columbus, Ohio, where I live. So go Bucks, right? If you know anything about Columbus, you know it's the home of the Ohio State Buckeyes. It's, we have a lot of football pride here and college football is a huge thing here. Very, very proud. So this was a, this was a conference, of the closing keynotes, a key aspect of the conference, over a hundred people in the room, regional conference for DEI specifically, diversity, diversity, equity, and inclusion for HR experts. So I asked the folks there whether they would hire a University of Michigan fan. Now, the relevant thing is that the University of Michigan is the big, big rivals of Ohio State Buckeyes. So big, big football rivals. It's one of the biggest rivalries in college football, if not the biggest rivalry. And you'll be interested to see what they said. Let's share the screen and see what exactly happened in that situation. Let's... All right, you should be able to 
see and hear this video clip now. So fortunately, I have it on video, which is a nice benefit of that, of that presentation. So as you know, I'm a professor at Ohio State. I'm contractually obligated to root for the Buckeyes. <laughs> I'm guessing there are a lot of Buckeyes fans here, you know, go Bucks, right? Yo, oh, there you go. Now, how likely are you to hire a Michigan fan? See, three people. Three people out of over a hundred. Three people out of over a hundred experts in diversity and inclusion. HR folks, experts in diversity and inclusion, only three of them would hire a University of Michigan fan. Now, I gave them a chance to change their now, mind. Now, regardless of how we feel about Michigan fans and their poor, poor choices, <laughs> in which team to root for, does that indicate anything about their performance as an employee? No, I know. Come on, that no should be stronger. <laughs> and they decided that they didn't want to change their minds, as you can see. So this is something that, again, these are HR professionals. They've been in the field for a long time. They're focusing on diversity and inclusion. That's their focus. That's like what the conference is about. And they wouldn't hire a University of Michigan fan. It might be hard to fathom, but that's how our minds work. That's how our stomachs work. That's how our gut reactions work. That's how unconscious bias works. So we have to understand that it's a very powerful thing that in, impacts all of us. The people in that audience are very much watching out for legally protected categories, things they're thinking about, things they're watching out for, but not watching out for many, many other things that are just part of unconscious bias. So let's take a look at another poll for halo and horns effect. Do you think it would be valuable for you and your team to investigate and address any negative impacts from the halo effect or the horns effect? Would it be valuable for you and your team to do that? investigate and address any negative impacts from the halo effect and the horns effect. Go ahead, please, and vote. See about half of you voted. Let's get the other half voting. Give you five more seconds to make your voice heard. Okay, great. So we see that the vast majority of you think it would be valuable to address the halo effect and the horns effect. So great. So that's something that you want to be thinking about how you as part of your team can work on addressing the halo effect and or the horns effect, investigating and addressing these. So make people aware of it, say, hey, this is something I learned about and thinking about. Let's think about how to address this. Now, Let's talk about another pair of cognitive biases that gets less attention than they deserve really, because it has to do with cognitive diversity. It's the way that we think. It's the optimism bias and the pessimism bias. The optimism bias and the pessimism bias, they're kind of like what they sound. You know, optimism bias refers to people who are like me, people who are opportunity oriented. I'm very entrepreneurial, I'm creative, but I tend to be too risk blind. You know, people who are startup enterprises. I started up disaster avoidance experts as the future proofing consultancy and training firm. Very opportunity oriented, looking at various things. I see the world as full of opportunities, full of promise, but I tend to avoid seeing threats. I tend to avoid seeing risks. I'm too risk blind. So there's benefits to being someone like me, someone who's optimistic and there's harms to it because I don't see the problems. I don't see the risks. The other cognitive bias here is called the pessimism bias. It, that refers to people who see a world as more full of threats than full of opportunities. These are people who focus on managing threats, who focus on stabilizing, who focus on improving, but who tend to be too risk averse, less creative, less entrepreneurial, less inter opportunity oriented than people who are out more fall into the optimism bias. So it's managing threats, stabilizing, improving, but two risk covers. And you need both on your team, at least two. You know, classically, what usually happens with people who don't realize that there's just different mindsets is that there's a lot of clashing. There's a lot of conflict between optimists and pessimists, where optimists would tend to say 
they would tend to spout off a lot of half-baked ideas. Now, I'm the kind of person who wakes up in the morning and has 20 brilliant ideas. Well, I've learned to my bitter regret that they're not all brilliant, but it feels like they are. And therefore, the intuition is for me to believe it. And if I didn't know that I shouldn't trust my intuition, shouldn't trust my gut, I would believe it and I would press for them. And the vast majority of optimists do. That's what happens, but that's not great. I mean, what how pessimists perceive these 20 half-baked ideas is that they feel threatened. They feel it's a danger to try to go around these ideas and they don't really realize that optimists shoot off at the hip and they give ideas that are half-baked. Pessimists, when they share ideas, really thought, think them through. They have fewer ideas, but the ideas are much more quality because pessimists thought through and addressed all the problems in these ideas before sharing them. Unfortunately, they don't share their earlier ideas that kind of quash them internally, even though the idea might have sparked a conversation that would have led to a positive outcome. So you need really both on your team. What I do is that I hand off those 20 brilliant ideas to team members who are pessimists. And they say, well, these are all half-baked ideas, but these, you know, of these uh, 20, maybe these three are worth finishing baking. And pessimists, like I said, they're not great at generating ideas. That's not their skill. That's not their fortitude. But that's not where they're strong. But what they're great at is evaluating ideas and then fixing the problems and implementing them. So managing threats, stabilizing, improving. That's their strength. Project managers on the whole, far from all, everyone tend to orient more toward the pessimism bias, managing threats, stabilizing, improving them, implementation. That's kind of where project managers tend to be. And many other folks in the organization, especially in sales, marketing, also in production, the R&D tend to be optimistic. And of course, other functions that are in, uh, in organization tend to be more pessimistically oriented, like let's say the financing and other control functions, which project management tends to be on the control function. And so you need to think about this and realize this. Teams need at least two, you know, for example, you know, when you do brainstorming, it's a really bad idea to have brainstorming where you force pessimists to do brainstorming. It's really uncomfortable for them and they feel threatened. It's a lot of emotional labor. You should really leave the brainstorming to the optimists. And then what optimists shouldn't do is feel like they have to defend their ideas. What they need to do is hand over control of their ideas to the pessimists and have pessimists evaluate them and improve them. That's what the perfect role for the collaboration between optimists and pessimists. Let's take a look at the poll about optimism bias and pessimism bias. Do you think it would be valuable for you and your team to investigate and address any negative aspects, impacts to your team from the optimism bias or the pessimism bias? Please go ahead and vote. Please go ahead and vote. All right, I see that most of you voted. Let's give you five more seconds. 78% of you voted. Let's give a couple more seconds for the rest of you to vote. Make your voice heard. All right, great. So the large majority of you, a little bit less than for the halo and horns effect, feel that it would be really valuable for you and your teams to investigate and address negative impacts from the optimism bias or the pessimism bias. And that's great. Again, inform your team, make them aware of what these are and taking the, the next steps on addressing and investigating the negative impacts by looking for them and seeing where they are and taking steps to help people collaborate much more effectively, reduce these team conflicts, whether they're within the organization, within a team, that's going to be really valuable for you. Great. Now, how do you overcome these dangerous judgment errors? What are the steps that you take? I've been telling you about some of these steps, being aware of them, assessing them, evaluating them, and then addressing them within internally with, for specific ju dangerous judgment errors. But let's talk about the broader principles. Overcoming them means overcoming your intuitions, overcoming your emotions, overcoming your gut, overcoming your heart, 
that's what it means because the whole gut, the heart, our intuitions, they were great for those early humans, for the kinds of environments they faced in the early, in the ancestral savanna and the social environment of the tribe. But it's really bad in the modern world. You don't want to be tribal in a global, multipolar, multicultural environment. That's a bad idea for you and for other people, for our very complex global society. And you know what? You've already do some of these things where you overcome your intuitions in a number of life areas, I can guarantee that. So for example, in talk, let's talk about eating, the very basic primal area, right? So in eating, we need to overcome our intuitions to eat as much sugar as possible. In the tribal environment, it was very important for us to eat as much sugar as possible. That, that was critical for us to eat as much sugar as possible in order to survive and thrive in that environment. Because in that environment, if we didn't eat as much sugar as possible, well, if we, when we came across a source of sugar, honey, apples, bananas, others would take it. And then they would be the ones who would be much more likely to survive, thrive, and reproduce. So we're inbuilt, we're wired to be triggered by sugar, to desire sugar and trigger, be triggered by it. Unfortunately, a number of food companies figured out how to take what's called a super stimulus. We have a stimulus from honey, we have a stimulus from apples and so on, but they create a super stimulus of very processed high calorie food like donuts. Now, it's very tempting when let's say a grateful vendor sends you a box of donuts and they're just sitting there in the break room open for everyone. When you're passing by, you know, just take a half a donut. And then, you know, once you take half a donut, you don't wanna leave half a donut for somebody else. So you take the other half. And then you're kind of triggered by the sugar. So you take another donut and then another donut. And before you know it, half the box is gone. Not that it ever happened to me, right? So that is a problem that we need to learn how to deal with and we need to learn how to address. And hopefully you've learned how to address this. You know, instead of going for the donuts, you can skip by them and go for the bowl of fruit that another grateful vendor sent over. That's a much healthier snack, much less triggering, much better for you and for that environment, of course. So that's one example of an activity you can do to deal with your intuitions. There are many, many other mental habits that you can have to deal with your desire for donuts or maybe ice cream or whatever else, whatever your treat of choice is. So it's very tempting for us to make the wrong choice, but you've probably all worked on your eating. I mean, we still have the beast epidemic here in the United States, which comes from people feeling like their gut is right and they following their intuitions about what to eat, but it's obviously a problem if you do so in the modern environment. You need to do the same for your judgments around other people, for your judgments around other people, because we make bad judgments around other people all the time. So for, this, for the sake of your physical fitness, you have been doing things to overcome your sugar impulse. The same should go for your mental fitness in your decision-making, again, around other people and other issues besides people. <laughs> so let's talk about what you need to have. What's the broader framework? Well, you need to be thinking about two, two separate concepts, emotional intelligence and social intelligence. Emotional intelligence and social intelligence. Emotional intelligence has to do with you, with yourself being aware of your gut reactions, your emotions, and being able to manage them. So awareness and management of your emotions. Just awareness is not sufficient. You also need to learn how to manage them. And of course, being able to manage them, if you're not aware of what's happening within you, you won't be able to manage it. So that's the awareness and management of your emotions, where they're driving you, the tribal impulse, other impulses, the cognitive biases that you need to learn about to be aware of them and manage them. Social intelligence is a different creature. It has to do with your awareness and your ability to manage, to influence other people, other people's emotions and their relationships with you and with each other. By doing that, you can help them overcome their unconscious bias toward others, their bad decision-making around other people. So in order to overcome unconscious bias, you really need both tools. One is within yourself, that's emotional intelligence, and one is around other people, that's social intelligence. Now, let's talk about how to do both. And one of these tools that I want to share with you about is an assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace. It focuses on the 30 most dangerous judgment errors, these cognitive biases in the workplace. That's what it's about. 
Now, I told you there are over 100. Not all of them are super relevant for the workplace. The 30 most dangerous ones are in the assessment, and I'll email you the assessment afterward if you want it. It helps you evaluate the extent and the impact of these cognitive biases, whether pessimism bias, optimism bias, halo effect, horns effect, overconfidence bias, and 25 others, and then provides you with the next steps for addressing them. That's what the assessment does. Now, let me share the screen. So you'll be able to see the assessment. Directions. So each of the questions of the assessment, the 30 questions, refers to a problem that might regularly occur. It's about behaviors. Again, it's not about the, nobody's asking you about the halo effect or the horns effect over confidence bias. Those underpin the questions, you know, the structure, just like the you know, underwear inside your clothes. They underpin the structure of the assessment, but what you see is the outerwear, is the behaviors that everyone can see and everyone can agree on. Your goal is to indicate how often the problem occurred in the past year, and the answer for each question will be in percentage terms out of all the possible times it might have occurred. You can focus on yourself as an individual with whom it occurred. You can focus on your team. You can focus on your department. You can focus on the group as a whole. Don't overthink it, really just go with your initial impression. Each question should take 10, 15, 20 seconds. And I want you to open up the chat feature. We'll be using the chat feature for this part of the presentation. Let's answer number six. So number six, when a potential or current employee was evaluated, in what percentage of the situations was the evaluation too positive due to factors not relevant to their job competency or organizational fit. So think about the last year. When was the evaluation too positive? Give a percentage, please. Percentage out of all the evaluations that took place, put them into the chat. Tia said 60%, Tiffany said 60%, Andrea said 50%, Tiffany 78, very precise, Renee 10%, Victoria, 70%, 40% from Chris. So we're seeing a range of numbers, 85%, 50%, a range of numbers from 10 to 85% and lots of 50s, 60s, 70s. 70s. Now, when you're in the 10 to 20% range, this isn't too big of a problem. You know, it's kind of within the variance that happens. When you're getting into the 20 to 30% range, that's becoming more of a moderate problem because you're kind of making bad decisions around people. When it's getting above 30, especially into the 40, 50, 60% range, that becomes a serious issue because you're making systematically bad judgments around people. And that's a serious, serious problem in your ability to run a company effectively, to run a team effectively. That is not good. So this is something that will help get that out there when you take it yourself and when you have your team take it, encourage your team to take it, and then you can discuss it and take next steps. Next steps are also discussed in the following section of the assessment. Let's take a look at another one that has to do with bad people decisions. And that of course is about the halo effect. So that's pretty clear. It's about two positive evaluations. Let's take a look at another one. The percentage of team conflicts that occurred because someone was overconfident about their quality of their communication skills and persuasiveness. Someone overestimated how effective they were in communicating and persuading others. So think about all the team conflicts that occurred. Out of all the team conflicts, whether 10, 20, 30, 50 over the last year, what percentage of them occurred for this reason? For this reason. Okay, so we're seeing Tia says 75, Rose says 25, Tiffany 35, Renee 50%, Chris 70%, Charlotte 95%, a couple of 50s from Maria and Kimberly, Andrea 25%, Victoria 40%. So again, a range, similar logic, you know, 10 to 20%, not too big of a problem, 20 to 30% becomes a moderate problem, over 30%, especially in the you know, 40s, 50s, 60s. So it becomes a serious issue. This refers to cognitive bias we haven't covered yet. It's called the illusion of transparency. When we communicate, we feel like the other person is getting 100% of what we're saying and internalizing 100%. It's just intuitive for us to feel that way. That's how our gut reaction is. Now, that's not the reality. There's a lot of technical issues in our virtual world right now. 
there can be a computer glitch and something like that, or a noise in somebody's background that you can't hear. In person, of course, it has happens as well. You know, you can be distracted thinking about the next uh, big meeting that you're having or what you'll be having for lunch for lunch that day, and you know, missing the the words that are coming out of a person's mouth. Or the person could be interpreting your words through their own filters. They can be hearing what you're saying, but they can be really focusing only on certain aspects of it, what they want to hear. And of course, that they might be hearing what you're saying, but completely disagreeing with it, but not showing it due to politics, politeness, or other things. So this is a serious issue, the illusion of transparency. And there are, well, there are 28 other questions that will help you address these sorts of issues. And then next steps for addressing them. Now, let's take another poll on this assessment. What do you feel would be the value to you and your team for taking this assessment and addressing the cognitive biases it uncovers? Would it be valuable for you and your team to do that, to take the assessment and address the cognitive biases that it uncovers? Please go ahead and vote. So we see that two thirds of you voted. I'll give you five more seconds if you haven't voted. Make your voice heard. Great. So the overwhelming majority of you found this assessment quite valuable and that you definitely think that it will be valuable for your new team. So great, then what you want to do if you did find it valuable is I will send it to you after the presentation. So for those who want it, and then what you'll want to do is Take it yourself, of course. See, you, know, you can focus on your team and your organization as a whole, whatever feels relevant to you, and then send it out to your team, your leadership. If if you the there's you know if you send it out to all team members, if you're a leader, if you want to, if you're a team member, not a leader, you might want to send it out to the leadership first, have a discussion with them about it. But strongly encourage everyone. The goal is to dis encourage everyone to take it and discuss the results together and take the next steps based on the results and the cognitive biases that it uncovers so that you can address them. So now you're aware of these cognitive biases after using the assessment, what do you do next? How do you specifically address them? One quick, easy and effective technique is using five questions to avoid decision disasters for every people decision and other sorts of decisions that you don't want to screw up. This is a technique meant to get a good enough answer. You don't, this is not about a perfect answer. It's not about the optimal answer. This is just a good enough answer. That's what this is about. You want to get a good enough answer. This is the technique you use. It gives you five questions that you use for every decision you don't want to screw up. First, what important information didn't I yet fully consider? So what evidence didn't you take into account? We're very, it's very tempting for us to look for evidence about other people and other topics that confirms our own beliefs. It's called the confirmation bias. And we tend to ignore evidence that doesn't confirm our own beliefs. If we are, tend to see other people from positive light due to the halo effect, we'll tend to ignore negative information about them and highlight positive. The same for the horns effect, many other things like this. So you want to think about information that goes against your intuitions twice as hard. Give it twice the weight, literally twice the weight to, if you have a halo effect around someone, give twice the weight to negative information. That's how, how you use this question. Also, the second part of it is important information. Uh, some questions don't require, some issues that your decisions don't require as much time, as much information gathering as others. So you want to decide what information is actually important to gather in relevance to this question. If you're writing an email that your goal is to just get someone to do something, that's probably you want a little bit of information, but not a huge amount of information, unless it's a really important email. But if you're trying to decide on someone's promotion or whether someone should be a member of your team or not, that's where you want to spend quite a bit more time on gathering information that you consider important. Next, what dangerous judgment errors didn't I yet address? We talked about the halo effect, horns effect, optimism bias, overconfidence bias, illusion of transparency, the pessimism bias. 
there are 24 more, more cognitive biases in the assessment. As you take the assessment, you go through them, you'll familiarize yourself with them very quickly and you'll be able to just bring them to the top of your mind after you ask the question. They won't come to the, the top of your mind otherwise. It's just how it works. You, want, you need to ask the question about what are the cognitive biases in the situation. Then what would a trusted and objective advisor suggest to you? So think about somebody neutral, somebody who's trusted, somebody who's objective. Maybe they're a mentor, a coach. Maybe they're a mem member of your PMI chapter. Maybe a you know, board member or someone like that. Someone who you trust and respect. Think about that mentor figure or envision one that you would ideally like to have as a mentor and think about what they would tell you about this decision. You get about 50% of the benefit of this angel on your shoulder just by asking the question. 50% of the benefit by getting outside of your own head. And you get the other 50% of the benefit, of course, by calling this person, easy enough. Of course, for more important questions. Next, question four. How have you addressed all the ways this could fail? If you're deciding to have somebody on your team, you know, does having them on the team bring in an element that is going to be too conflictual, too strident, or does leaving them out mean that important stakeholders aren't consulted and engaged? That's a problem. How might an email to someone fail when you're trying to persuade them to go forward with a project that you're managing or a certain component of a project or to give you the resources that you need? How have you addressed all the ways it could fail? Think about the decision completely failing and then all the reasons why it failed. And then how can you address these reasons in advance? Finally, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? What would cause you to change your mind about a person? What would cause you to shift your perspective? Think about that information in advance before you actually make the decision. Because once you make a decision, we tend to be very strongly committed to the decision. It's called post-factum rationalization. We rationalize our decisions after the fact. You don't want to be in that position. What you want to do is decide in advance what kind of information will cause you to change your mind. And that will make it much easier for you to update your beliefs, shift your perspective, make revise your decision after the decision. Now, let's take a look at the poll. So again, we're using polling. Let's talk about this technique. Do you think it would be valuable for you and your team to use the five questions to avoid decision disasters technique to avoid making bad decisions? In those cases, we're good enough is good enough. Again, it's not for the you know, most supremely important decisions, not hiring the CEO of your organization. There needs to be a much more thorough vetting, but good enough decisions you know, where you just want a good enough answer, not the perfect answer, good enough answer. So about two thirds of you voted. Let's give five more seconds for the rest of you to make your voice heard. See, 73% of you voted. Oh, good, giving 78%. Great, so we see even more people voted. That's great. So this is, seems to be the most popular tool yet. 94% of you believe it would be valuable for you to use this technique. So great, so you should, I'll send you a decision aid, which you can print out and put by your computer, put uh, by your, on the fridge, some pe people do that, put it on the fridge. They definitely put it by their computer in a new virtual world. Yeah. You can put it in your office once you get back to the office or if you're back in the office as an essential personnel or something like that for everyone to use. So as a reminder, you will have, it'll be very important for you to have those reminders. So decision aid will be a crucial reminder tool for you. And then you can email out the decision aid to your team members, members of your team and say, hey, this is a tool. I really think we should use it. Let's all talk about how we can effectively use it together. It's very effective, especially in team decision-making when you're thinking about a team, not on simply individual members of a team using it, but when you have a decision to make as a team, what you do is have everyone answer privately before a team meeting these questions for themselves. And then you structure the agenda of the team meeting around these five questions. And then everyone just goes around the room sharing their answers, you discuss the answers, and you come to a conclusion on each question. And then you proceed through it and you can feel very confident about the results of your decision once you finish that process. It's a great technique for making decisions, whether about projects, about people, all sorts of decisions. And so this is something I strongly recommend you use as part of a team decision-making technique. I've seen teams not only make better decisions, but cut down their meeting times by about 60% because the conversation is not nearly as meandering and complex as it would be otherwise.
All right, and I promised some free resources. Let's get to that. So the free additional resources that you can get if you wish them is the assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace, so PDF of it, a decision aid on five key questions to avoid decision disasters, then some sample chapters from my best-selling book, The Blind Spots Between Us, How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and Build Better Relationships. And finally, a coaching session with me. So there are three open slots, first come, first serve. So whoever claims those slots first, you will get the coaching sessions. I'll send out the link for the coaching session. I know I give that question over all the time in the Q&A. So what I'll do is I'll send out a link and it'll only work for the first three people who click on it and schedule the coaching session. So that's gonna be how it works. I'll send you the resources and then you just go click on the link and schedule a session. And I'll send out the re those resources, I think by tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon. But in the meantime, let's see who wants those resources. So the post-training resources. Would you like to get the key post-training free resources from me as the trainer? Please go ahead and vote on that. All right. And in the meantime, I'll be happy to take whatever questions that you might happen to have about the presentation. Please go ahead. You can unmute yourself or you can use the chat feature, whatever is most comfortable for you. Give folks five more seconds to vote in the meantime. So please go ahead, vote if you haven't yet. Okay, I'm waiting for questions. Again, chat or unmute yourself, either is fine. Hi, Dr. Glenn. This is Renee. I, Hi, I have Renee. a question. Uh -huh. um, so thank you for this. This is really interesting. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the aids and things like that. I'm wondering, you know, did you come across these five questions, you know, during your research time or kind of a com combination or like, how did you come up with this to kind of prove that these things are working, right? Right. They're all informed by the research on specific ways that we can debias ourselves, address cognitive biases. So for example, question five, let me go back to the questions, is based on, call, on a technique called the external perspective. So when we look at the external perspective, when we take an external perspective outside of ourselves, we're much more likely to make a good decision. So for example, um, for a project management example, when you have a team of people who are doing a project and they assess themselves and their likelihood of project success, they will tend to be greatly overconfident about their project. It's been extensively shown by research. However, when they assess another team that has the same characteristics as the people in this team and their likelihood of succeeding in the project, they're much more realistic about project success. And that, is something that you need to do by getting outside of yourself and saying, what would a trust and objective advisor suggest I do? So that's the way to instantiate the technique. So all of these questions are based on specific, a number of studies showing that specific techniques work in addressing cognitive biases. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome, Renee. I have one more question. Um, so yeah. as a project manager, putting it in, kind of our perspective, these are, could these also be used as questions to kind of ask your team as you're working through talking about risks? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Oh, I'm developing a course with RIMS, the Risk and Insurance Management Society, which is the associate, largest association of risk professionals in the world. And they these questions are an important aspect of what they're doing. They're not, they've realized they haven't really been addressing cognitive bias risks in their planning, they've been addressing strategic risks and so on, but not cognitive bias risks, not the ones that come from bad decisions that people make just because of how our brains are wired. So I'm working with them to develop courses for them. And these five questions are a really important part of the coursework, of the structure, the, because they're so easy and clear and 
absolutely very applicable that people can apply very easily in all sorts of interactions. It just takes a couple of minutes to ask these questions of yourself and of your team members, as you pointed out, Renee. And it's very, very effective. Not simply about people decisions, why I was pointing out. It's about all sorts of decisions, about okay. projects, timelines, resources, all sorts of things that you don't want to screw up. If you risks, problems, you know, even politics, who, which it, it, is the leadership likely to support this project or something like that. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I can see you using this in like my Scrum and Agile team. So there's a question from Tia in the chat. It asks, she, Tia asks, do you think people are more hypersensitive the unconscious bias over the last year? And might that affect how we react? I think people are hypersensitive around unconscious bias, uh, specifically around skin color discrimination and also pre due to previous dynamics, the Me Too movement, gender discrimination. I've seen that be much more, people are more sensitive and more aware of it. You know, now with the politics, uh, you know, Cuomo in the news that's raising more awareness of the gender-based discrimination. So those are things that people are more aware of than they were, but there's so many other aspects of cognitive, uh, of unconscious bias that people are not paying attention to and that they really should be paying attention to in order to make good decisions. Even these optimism bias and pessimism bias, these are all forms of unconscious bias where we make bad judgments, decisions around people who are optimistic. If, people, if pessimistic people make bad decisions around people who are optimistic, optimists make bad decisions around people who are pessimistic, and that's not great for anyone. It doesn't help collab effective collaboration. And so though that's how we respond to this first question. And might that affect how we react? I certainly think that it does very much affect how people react to those specific forms of unconscious bias around skin color and around gender issues. So that certainly makes that those two stronger triggers than they would have been otherwise. Thank you for asking the question to you. Others? Yep, that's a great question. What else? Anybody else? Now's your chance. Now is your, as Dr. Glipp says, now is your opportunity to mm -hmm. be heard. <laughs> so I'm going to steal that one. Um, Happy to. Please do. Yeah, so, okay. Anybody else? Anything? Oh, here, here comes another one from Maria. Mm -hmm. Are unconscious bias learned or instinct? The un the halo and horns effect and tribalism in general is instinct. Now, the specific ways that they're expressed in our society is learned. You know, for example, obviously skin color is very important in the American society, at least as a form of unconscious bias and that really is impactful. But, you know, if we go back, if we go to, let's say, India, and think about the caste system there. Whether you are one member of the untouchable caste, which is the lowest caste, very much, det or the Hindu caste, which is the highest caste, very much determines your success in India. <laughs> but that very much, that, that really doesn't matter much to us here in the United States, what caste people are, right? That doesn't really matter. Or let's say the conflicts between Shiites and Sunnis. That's a fundamental aspect of people's lives in the Middle East and other majority Muslim religions, you know, religious areas. But it's much, much less important here in the United States, even within the Muslim community. There's much more that Muslims share, whether they're Shiite or Sunni. So the specific ways that tribalism is expressed elsewhere, that these cognitive biases are expressed elsewhere, and here they are learned. But the underlying tribalism the dynamic that we like people who have our values and our characteristics is going to be the same and that we are opposed to those who we perceive as not being part of our tribe. Other that was a great question. All right, anybody have any other questions? I have a comment. Um, yeah just about my thinking on some of the, um, on some of your poll questions. Uh -huh. I found myself trying to decide if I have a work mindset in answering the question, mm -hmm. or if it's just, uh, you know, in my personal life mindset, like how am I answering the question or 
maybe I should say yes because that's what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> so I found myself having a <laughs> dilemma like how should I answer the question and I don't know if you have any advice on sure. that or if there's worth making a distinction mm -hmm. um, when when maybe asking some of the poll questions. Yeah, I mean, for the poll questions, I intended to be, it's about project management, right? This is a presentation for project management professionals like you, Tia. So it's meant to be very much from your perspective as a project management professional, less so from your personal life. So you know, the assessment that, you know, the, the assessment directions are framed from the perspective, you know, choose what you're going to be answering, choose your perspective, you know, choose your own adventure, what you're going to be focusing on yourself, your team, your organization as a whole, but the polling is really about you and you. That's why the polling is about you and your team. And that's really a work matter. So yeah, it's, a, it's about work. And you certainly don't have to answer yes. If you don't find it valuable, that's not something that's valuable for you. <laughs> that's just you know what, what's happening. Maybe the optimism bias and pessimism bias aren't a problem for your organization. You know, who knows? Other folks, comments or questions, both welcome. There was another, there are a couple more questions. Um, this is, what are some ways we can help our children overcome unconscious bias? What's it? Education. So you really want to focus on educating them about this tribalism, what's going on, and by not shaming and guilting. You know, one of the worst ways of talking about unconscious bias is by saying that it's a terrible thing that you feel this negative way toward people who aren't part of you know, your religion or your politics or who don't have even skin color or gender or you know, <laughs> whether the, the sports team, because this shaming has been shown to really not be effective. Just like with eating, right? We talked about eating with those donuts. Fat shaming is a very bad way of actually causing people to lose weight. It does not work, extensive research shows. So you don't want to use shame or guilt in educating people about unconscious bias. You want to talk about how it's a natural thing to be tribal. It's just how we are. All of us are tribal. It's inbuilt in us. It's part of our wiring. Now, that doesn't mean it's a good idea to act on this wiring in the modern world, just like it's not a good idea to eat half a dozen donuts at once in the modern world. The modern world is not a fit for that tribal mindset, neither is the fit for sugar triggering. So we need to take steps to correct our intuitions, our instincts, you know, we should not be primal, we should not be savage, we shouldn't follow Tony Robbins. But that's not a good idea. We need to be civilized. And being civilized, by definition, means going against some of those primal, savage, tribal, natural instincts, whatever the flavor of wording you want to use. So that's the way that education is really helpful. And that is, is very relatable for children. That's also the way I would explain it in a presentation to folks who are somewhat resistant to these concepts. So diversity trainings, especially if I know, if I'm informed in advance that there's some folks in the audience who are resistant to these concepts, I talk about not shaming, not guilt. That's a really crucial part of the presentation shown for me so that to help address the defensiveness that takes down most diversity trainings. Most diversity trainings, by the way, for those, I'm sorry, for those who may participate or engage or give them are actually not effective because they rely too much on shaming and guilting and negativity. That has been shown to actually cause blowback against with people who do have those discriminatory impulses and don't feel like they should be controlling them. It causes them to be even more discriminatory in the future. It actually lowers their ability to judge people and minorities effectively. You have, you see decreases in the numbers of minority groups by managers who were given a more traditional DEI training that's more focused on neg negativity, shaming and guilt, which the large majority of them still are, unfortunately. So it's not a good idea. So that's, uh, the, that's what I would say is both applicable to children and has been shown to also be applicable to people who might have some of these impulses within them that they don't feel they should be strongly actively fighting. All right, we have Hello. time for another. Oh, go ahead, good. Yeah. Hi, um, I apologize if I have a bad connection. Um, so I really found that um, unconscious bias towards accent, obviously I have an accent, <laughs> 
Um, I'm myself an immigrant. Mm -hmm. um, sure. I felt it. Mm. Um, and uh, I mean, we, we, we know it, it is um, happening, but what is, uh, I guess, your recommendation on people who have this impulse? Um, it's instinct or you think it's learned. So I don't know how, so I agree that it exists, but I don't know how you're, um, you're gonna approach it or you suggest um, people to approach it. Are you asking them to think twice when they are um, going to make a decision mm -hmm. or um, what, is, what is your, and then, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I'll say the second one later. <laughs> Great. So with how to approach people about that's kind of social intelligence. That's, that's what that aspect is about. So you want to be aware of their emotions. If they are the kind of person who, I presume the kind of people who have come to this presentation who want to listen about unconscious bias are the kind of people who want to address unconscious bias. So I wasn't really focusing too much on the shame and guilt and kind of the natural aspects of the presentation. I was focusing more on delivering the information. You want to start with the person that you're dealing with and understanding their emotions. What are their motivations? What are their desires? Do they care about addressing unconscious bias? Or is that not something that they even care about? They just you know, want to do the activity. If they don't care about it, you need to understand that. I need to see that, okay, they're, they're not gonna be caring that much about unconscious bias. You can be much more, you should be much more casual and careful in the way that you talk about this topic. And you should talk about informing them, educating them, saying, you know, oh, hey, I learned this thing about tribalism, how we're all tribal and how this is like, powerful thing and here are some ways that I'm tribal. Do you think that there might be some ways that you're tribal? That's a much more um, friendly and much less intense conversation. Doesn't make the person feel defensive. You're admitting some tribalism on your part and then you're all getting them to open up about you know, any aspects of tribalism that they feel. And that's an opportunity for you to bring up after they talk about this topic a little bit, their tribalism, talk about what you found out about accent discrimination. So tying that to yourself and potential, you know, not saying that, not telling that person, even if they are, that, hey, you might be discriminating against me because of my accent, but just bringing it up as a topic and saying, oh, you know, you've heard about this thing and seeing what they have to say about it. And so having that sort of conversation is low key, low stakes, doesn't make them feel defensive. That's the main thing you want to avoid, making them feel defensive because defensiveness just causes them to shut down, dislike you, have more of a horns effect, and then not be able to overcome this unconscious bias and even think that you know this concept is ridiculous and that they that they're going to ignore it. Um, thanks for the response. So you're basically saying to raise awareness um, with your with your say it's a team member or mm -hmm. um, raise awareness in an emotionally but... sensitive way. So that is the key. right, right, right. But um, I have a comment about the the pessimistic, optimistic yeah. uh, discussion. Um, so I myself consider uh, myself a pessimistic person. Many um, are not not uh, not really proud of it, <laughs> but that's um, uh, usually how I am. I am project and, managers, um, you should be as a project manager proud of it. <laughs> I mean, that's that's definitely yeah. a very important skill of a project right. manager. <laughs> You know, right. having, um, being pessimistic about a project. I mean, there's so many projects. I mean, oh, <laughs> there was a study in 2004 that showed that about 84, and I'm sorry, 86% of all major construction projects go over time and over budget. <laughs> you know, right. th that's an example. And there's lots of other studies like this. But project right. managers, you need to address threats. You need to be risk managers. That's sure. a very important quality. So you should be proud of it, actually. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but but I, I also, at the same time, I, I tend to come up with a lot of ideas. Um, mm -hmm. So I right. noticed you you mentioned maybe, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe I didn't understand well, like, um, so you have your team members and you divide them to pessimistic and optimistic and ask for opinions from optimistic people. Mm -hmm. and that part I had a little problem with. Okay. <laughs> maybe, I, <laughs> yeah, maybe, I, I don't know. I. It, it just I, I didn't understand like what's your suggestion is is, sure. is your suggestion um first give them a questionnaire figure out who is um pessimistic who is optimistic and and like um try to get ideas more from one or or try to um approach their ideas differently 
for what is what is the key of that technique is that you don't want to force everyone to do brainstorming the initial stage there are the most people who are pessimistic they don't deal well with brainstorming it's very emotionally laborious for them they feel negative about it they feel mostly are not as able to come up with ideas and they don't like that nearly as much and you might be less it, it, it might be the case that you have come that you come up with ideas and they're great and it feels good for you and that's something you've trained yourself in the same way that people have trained themselves to not eat all the donuts in the donut box to do despite some of your pessimism but optimists are just naturally much better coming up with ideas but because they don't have that filter that pessimists have not much, much less right. of a filter to say to say that way so it's much much more of a natural activity now if pessimists want to do that that's great that's wonderful the problem is when they're forced to do things that are really go against their personality and their predisposition and that harms them in the same way that i would not give optimists the large majority of optimists the job of evaluating ideas because you know they they, they really hate killing their darlings and <laughs> as the phrase goes and that's a big problem for if optimists are there and they're kind of still keeping hold of their ideas. So there's a division, natural division of labor. It doesn't mean that all optimists are bad at evaluating ideas or all pessimists are bad at generating ideas. Right. But uh, for the first part, um, how are you going to um, uh, basically um, figure out who is optimistic, who is pessimistic? Do you have like kind of a questionnaire for, for your team members or? Most people um, know how that are you about, gonna tell them sure. what is this question about? Most people You're know that be about very themselves. Open about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a problem to be pessimistic or optimistic. Most people are relatively open about it. The only thing that there's some companies, some cultures where being pessimistic is seen as a negative thing. So people will call themselves something like, I'm not pessimistic, I'm realistic. <laughs> you know, that's what they would use. And when they call themselves a realist, you definitely know they are pessimist. <laughs> that's the, you know, more polite in some company cultures, terminology for pessimists. Or, you know. But yeah, it's very easy to tell who in the team is going to be optimistic, who in a team meeting is going to be, whenever somebody comes up with a new idea, who are they, are they going to be reinforcing and praising other people's idea? And we're not talking about politics, setting politics aside, setting interdepartmental conflicts aside. So setting that aside, you know, within the same department, generally team or something that doesn't have any feudal issues, resource issues, hierarchy issues, just who is going to be reinforcing ideas that other people come up with and saying, oh yeah, great, let's do this. Or maybe even this, or maybe even that. What, versus who is somebody going, oh, okay, let's slow down. Let's think about the problems. Let's think about the issues. That's, it's pretty easy to tell that. And I have a, I, in the book that uh, sample chapters, you'll see a chapter on optimism and pessimism that goes through it, the, the ways that you can tell. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a very easy thing to do. You know, that's kind of the least of the problems. You could also just see, you know, would, do you prefer generating ideas or do you prefer improving ideas? That's a question that you know, the large majority of optimists will say they're generating ideas. The large majority of pessimists will say improving ideas. Got it. Thank you so much for, for the answer. I appreciate you're, it. You're very welcome. Other folks. So just a time check. We have about eight minutes left and I do want to do a couple of drawings, but we have time for another question or two, if anybody has any other questions or comments. I will say that I'm thinking about this, not only from a business perspective, but just in my own personal life, which my husband being more, he calls himself a realist and <laughs> me being more of an optimist and how, how just thinking about, you know, risk taking and all of that kind of stuff is just kind of not in their DNA, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. just being more sensitive to that for those of us that are optimists and mm -hmm. are pessimists, just to think about the other side and just kind of accept that. Yeah. So it's a good lesson learned for me for that too. <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad to hear that, Renee. Yeah, definitely. It applies to my life as well. My wife is a pessimist and I've definitely had to learn how to handle that well and collaborate effectively. So right now, you know, when I have 
brilliant ideas for home activities and projects and you know DIY gardening. I definitely run them by her if uh, I don't <laughs> want to screw up. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. All right. All right. Uh, so thank you very much. Then I will turn it over to you and leave the meeting for you. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Glover. This is very informative. Very you are you are very welcome. Okay. Have a good evening. You too. All right, everyone, I'm going to share my screen. Um, very welcome, I, everyone. Bye-bye.